Support for this episode of Judaism Unbound comes from the Ashman Family JCC in Palo Alto, California, whose vision is to be the architects of the Jewish future. The Ashman Family JCC empowers you to experience Jewish paths toward a life of joy, purpose, and meaning through innovative Jewish learning and wellness programs, community building, and initiatives to develop the next generation of Jewish leaders. Learn more at www.paloaltojcc.org. This is Judaism Unbound, episode 339, Education, Learning, Not Literacy. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Dan Liebenson. And I'm Lex Rofberg. And yes, I am Dan Liebenson. I am back after a two-week hiatus of doing these intros. Lex took over generously and also in an attempted coup. As I had COVID after avoiding it for two years, and I appreciate everybody's well wishes, all the get well soon wishes that folks sent me. Anyway, it's great to be back. And it's especially great to be back with our guest today, Diane Tickton Schuster. She is an expert in adult Jewish learning. And of course, we're in the adult Jewish learning business. Judaism Unbound, the podcast, has been doing a form of adult Jewish learning for over six years now. And we launched our new Unyeshiva initiative, which includes live classes. And we launched that about a year ago. And so before we get into our introduction of Diane Tickton Schuster, I'll just mention, as Lex did last week, that we have now opened registration for a month of short classes that are going to take place right before the high holidays. As always, they feature some of our favorite guests like Jill Hammer, Joy Layden, Chava de Cordova, Binya Coat, Jay Michelson, who will be our guest next week, and me. Lex is actually sitting out this month, but he'll be back teaching after the high holidays. And we even have a class taught by somebody who's not yet been a guest on Judaism Unbound. So check out all the classes that are being offered at judaismunbound.com slash classes. And we're excited to invite you to move from being a listener to being a much more active participant in all of this thinking and imagining and reimagining that we're doing as part of the Judaism Unbound universe. So let's try to put this work that we're doing with the Anyashiva into a larger context in our conversation today with Diane Tickton Schuster. As I said, she is an expert in adult Jewish learning, and she has edited a book that has just come out called Portraits of Adult Jewish Learning, Making Meaning at Many Tables. It's an edited volume. Our guest today wrote the introduction and conclusion and also did all the editing, but there are eight chapters that are written by other people. Some of them have been Judaism Unbound guests like Miriam Heller Stern and Tobin Belzer, or have participated in other Judaism Unbound events like Shavuot Live, such as Laura Yaris. And the authors are writing about the Jewish learning that takes place at some of the organizations of folks that have been guests on Judaism Unbound such as Aaron Henney of Theodore Dibbuk. So we really felt right at home reading this book. We'll get into the idea of portraits, but basically rather than being a typical academic book that is just an analysis, these are basically stories of eight different Jewish educational contexts and an exploration of how they work and why they work and who participates in them. It's much more qualitative than quantitative. It's a really engaging form of scholarship. So let's get into this conversation. A few words of introduction of our guest today. Diane Tickton Schuster is an independent scholar in Jewish education who has served since 2016 as an affiliated scholar at Brandeis University's Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Center for Studies in Jewish Education. Previously, she taught at Hebrew Union College, Los Angeles, the American Jewish University, Brandeis University's Institute for Informal Jewish Education, and California State University, Fullerton. Her 2003 book, Jewish Lives, Jewish Learning, is considered a classic in the field of adult Jewish learning. Diane Tickton Schuster is an adult developmental psychologist with a PhD from Claremont Graduate University. Diane Tickton Schuster, Welcome to Judaism Unbound. It's so great to have you. Delighted to be with you guys. So we're really excited to have this conversation with you because we have not had too many conversations with folks who are experts on adult Jewish learning. And we haven't really opened up the question of adult Jewish learning that much on this podcast. I'm, I'm sort of wondering why that is. Is it just that there isn't that much 
theory going on about adult Jewish learning and to the extent that that there ought to be more, what do you think, what are you coming into this thinking about the real difference being in terms of thinking about adult Jewish learning versus childhood Jewish learning? It's a big question with many answers, and it's a question I've been grappling with for about 25 years because I came out of a background of developmental psychology, particularly focusing on adult development and adult learning. And yet when I myself began, be, became involved in adult Jewish learning activity, I found that there was no literature on it. There was no one had written about the adult Jewish learning experience. And I began by asking people the stories of their learning and then made a great effort to connect that with the literature in the, in the general education world. There is a vast literature about adult learning. It's part of education in general. There has been a growing appreciation that while learning is learning, adults come to the learning experience very differently than children. They are voluntary. They tend to be particularly in the Jewish experience and self-directed. They decide what they want to learn and where they're going to go find it. They bring life experience that shapes their expectations and often their biases against Jewish learning. And so compared to the bar mitzvah child or the even the camp child who's told this is what you're going to do and you're going to go and this is going to be handed to you as an educational experience. The fact is that for adults, they have less time. They're more protective of their, of their time. And the center, one of the reasons for the subtitle of making meaning at many tables, it's that the meaning making for the adult is paramount. If I can't make personal meaning of this, if I can't see the relevance to my life, I will go on and do something else. On the other hand, if I make meaning at this particular table, which could be a, an informal space, it could be a formal classroom, it could be a podcast. If I begin to make that connection, that meaning, I'm going to want more. And that's one of the things we know about adult learners. The more they learn, the more they want to learn. There are kids like that. No question there are kids like that. But certainly what we know about adult Jewish learners is they get so excited once they enter into whatever learning space feels meaningful to them or gives them an opportunity to make personal meaning, that then it becomes a way of, of life, which is one of the things we hope for. I mean, part of the joy of studying adulthood is to see how much growth and change occurs over the adult years. You're not fixed. And that, that is one of the luxuries of, of our contemporary society. Or maybe it's the punishment. We, we don't make a job and stay there forever. But we don't make a Jewish identity forever ever either. We are in and out. There's a lot of fluidity, a lot of movement. But as I say, what we've seen in the little bit of research that exists, and that was one of your questions, if Jewish education is on the fringe of general education, adult Jewish education is on the fringe of that fringe. There are no doctorates in adult Jewish learning. There's no journal of adult Jewish learning. There's no national database about adult Jewish learning. We're inventing it all the time. There is no field yet of adult Jewish learning. I agree very much with what Dan said before, that we have not had too much conversation about like theories of adult Jewish education for all the reasons you brought up. I mean, I'm, I'm flashing back to our episodes on broadly speaking Jewish education. We did do a, like a mini series with a bunch of different folks, and I'll put a link to all those episodes in the show notes. But I, I remember some pieces of that, and I guess I'm being called back to it, and I kind of want to ask you... And I'll follow up after it. But like, I, I want to mm -hmm. ask you broadly, like, what is Jewish education? Um, not adult Jewish education. What is Jewish education? And you can answer that however you want. But part of why I'm asking and part of what I'm getting at is that I think we relate to, I don't know, the construction of Jewish identity or like the construction of our emotions, feelings, knowledge base that we have about Judaism. We, re we approach it differently than some other realms of our lives. And I think that's interesting, right? Like when I talk to people about their favorite music or like their relationship to music, they don't tend to start by talking about like, I took band in middle school and high school and then in college. I, like, that's not how we talk about music. It's like the, my I encountered in life you know, whether that was in a car listening to the radio or my parents telling me their favorite music, whatever. It's just, you know, informal spaces where we hear music and eventually some of that music we really like and others we don't. 
when we're talking about our relationship to Judaism, it's different from music. We tend to say, ah, I went to this synagogue. I went, I, I was trained in Sunday school. I went, maybe, you know, there's a summer camp or a youth group or whatever. And if you didn't do those things, you feel like you didn't do Absolutely. Jewish education. Right. And so my sense is that one of the claims of your book that's important is that Jewish education is happening at a lot of moments we don't know it's happening or we mm -hmm. don't notice that it's happening. Are there ways in which Jewish education, quote unquote, might be more like how we relate to music in the way I was talking about or how we relate to sports? Like in the same way, I don't say that my relationship to sports is because I took gym class growing up. Like, no, I have all sorts of pieces in my life that made me connect to various teams or to various sports I play. Um, how might we think more broadly about where Jewish education is even happening? I have to start with the book that I wrote that came out in 2003 called Jewish Lives, Jewish Learning, which linked Jewish lives and Jewish learning, that they are, they are not separate. But the starting point with that book was that I would ask in interviews, could you tell me about your life, your journey, if you see it as a journey, Jewishly, and people would stop. And first they would say, no one ever asked me that question before. And then they would look up at the ceiling and most times talk about a negative experience, the rejecting congregation, the rejecting rabbi, the feeling inadequate, the bar mitzvah anxiety, the feeling uh, that, that there was materialism and that didn't fit their sense of self. There was a negative connection between Jewish life to say nothing about their learning. They didn't see themselves as having been engaged in a Jewish learning journey at all. But all kinds of things emerged that made that showed how rich we are, in, whether both Jews and non-Jews have Jewish learning experiences. We, lear, we learn about being Jewish as a non-Jew. We learn about being a non-Jew as a Jew. We are constantly in, in dialogue with what, it, what is Judaism? What is Jewish experience? What is Jewish life? Then you get into Israel, Yiddish, Holocaust, Kalal Yisrael, ritual, what is Jewish learning? It's all of those and more and more and more. So to go with, you know, as John Levison points out, and I give particular tribute to in this book, I'm so appreciative for it. The old paradigm that Jewish learning was having a set body of information imposed on you that determined what you were supposed to learn, the skills you needed to be literate. I don't discount those. I think those are important skills. I wish many times I had more of them, but it's, it's like when uh, long-term learners are making their own marginal notes in the text, and that is when they enter into the Jewish conversation because they themselves are contributing. If you're gonna be in this conversation, then you've gotta be a conversation partner. So Jewish learning to Jewish education is helping people to embrace the wholeness of the Jewish experience and make personal meaning of it, whether you're a child or an adult, and to recognize the many, many layers, Jewish history, the sociology, the anthropology, the, the mysticism of Judaism, all of that is Jewish learning. So that really resonates. And one theme that kept coming up is that it's not just about this word literacy. So what you just said, I'm sort of hearing in that um, a pushback on classic notions of what Jewish education is, that it's about literacy. It's about literally like in the sense that one learns how to read, um, one learns Judaism, basically. Like one is introduced to what Judaism is and then you're literate. One learns it. text. Yeah, you learn a text and then you learn how to interpret that text and you learn how to debate that text. But that's not all of Jewish learning. Right. And and we're really deeply aligned with that. So I'd love just to hear you say more about about that. But I I do feel called to just sort of bring it back into that theme from before about part of the problem is that we're limiting where Judaism happens, right? If Judaism is about being able to function in a synagogue, like being able to know what's happening, being able to follow the words of the prayers in Hebrew or maybe even in English or other language, being able to know what the artwork on the wall is referring to, what the books on the shelf are referring to, how to navigate those books on the shelf, what the different ritual items in the gift shop mean and how you would deploy them at different times of year. Like, I kind of think that's how a lot of people are operating with like what it is to become 
an engaged Jew or like sort of a success story of Jewish education. A success story in many people's minds is somebody who can use all those objects in the way that our ancestors have used them and who can say the words that our ancestors have said, et cetera, et cetera. And I sense in you a pushback on that. And from my perspective, it relates to a need to get beyond the space of the synagogue. Because if Judaism is not something you do in one particular sort of synagogue space, then all of a sudden, mobilizing it is a much broader question. And what it would mean to be, you know, quote unquote, literate in it would be a much broader story. So I guess I'm all that's to say, like, say more about the spaces of Judaism, maybe some of the specific spaces that come up in your book, and how we might be pushed to conceptualize Jewish education beyond classrooms and synagogues. I think that the starting point for the discussion of spaces has to be a very generational one. We know that synagogues are losing membership, closing. They're often not relevant to the younger population. And I'm the, the mother of a synagogue rabbi, so I certainly am committed to synagogue, synagogue life and thriving. But there are limitations in those spaces. And what is that, that where, where those spaces don't speak to people at certain state times of their lives. I'm thinking about a book many years ago that warned synagogues and churches that churches and synagogues had better wake up because 12-step programs and other spiritually centered activities were going to attract people when they didn't have to pay for a membership. And we've seen a lot of that. So that the space is how can I be me and bring myself as a Jew and my questions and be with people who honor, this gets to the issue of who are the educators, who honors my questions rather than making, making me feel diminished for what I don't know. To have facilitators, educators, leaders, people who are a little bit ahead of me, that's one of the big learning theory things. You don't need to have an expert, but just someone who's had a little more experience than you becomes a role model and validates your experience. That's why some of the peer-led or slightly advanced peers make a very big difference. But I think that the availability to do Jewish in a museum, to do it in a social justice program, to do it in a leadership development program, or in an agency, a Jewish work setting that has non-Jews and serves non-Jewish clients, which is what Josh Layden's chapter in the book is about the Jewish Family and Child Services Agency in San Francisco. That's Jewish education right there to bring people into a Jewish conversation without saying heavy handedly, well, we're a Jewish place, so you have to do it this way. It's that we ask these questions and we are guided by core values. It's this living of Judaism and recognizing that Judaism doesn't have all the answers or doesn't have an answer. And that I think is part of the appeal certainly to the convert population who come in from dogmatic traditions where there's only an answer and um, are excited by the opportunity for discourse and debate and that you don't have to commit to a set belief system. That's very important to adult learners and particularly to people who are coming in with their own uncertainties and insecurities. So I'd love to do a little bit of just sort of, I don't want to say small picture. Your book is very big picture, but I'd love to just get into like, what's your book? What's this book? Yeah, it's good. Um, we'll put links in the show notes, all that good stuff. Okay. But the book, you <laughs> are the the kind of bookends. You're you're the, oh, bookends of the book. I didn't even do that right. on purpose. Um, you, there's a foreword, I guess, but you're the intro and the conclusion. And then there's a bunch of essays in the middle. And I'm kind of curious I guess to do a little bit of this chronologically, like your intro makes some cool claims and it also, it starts with a picture and the word portrait is in your title. So I'd love to start with just like, what was the beginning impetus for this book? What did you put in that intro? And why did you land on this? I don't want to say metaphor. It's actually, I think, kind of literal of, but this language of portraits. So six years ago, John Levison, the director of the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Center for Studies in Jewish Education at Brandeis University, called me and said he had some recent doctoral students who'd written dissertations that they'd like to get published, but they were in all academic 
lingo, and could I help these two recent doctorates write their stories in more user-friendly language? So I said to John, yes, I could help these two uh, authors write their stories as portraits. He used the language portraits, but really portraits in that sense meant something that showed the learning experience. That's not the scientific side. It's how do we look at this picture and what do we see in this picture? And I would go so far as to say, it's the difference between a snapshot and footage. In the footage, we see the trajectory. Portraits we think of as fixed, but in fact, one of the reasons in this book that the portrait I use at the back of the book is outside the frame, is the person's legs over the edge of the frame, is that we need to see the motion. Sorry, just to really make that clear, because people, uh, first off, we'll put the images in the show notes, but just Please. you start the you start the book off with this image of a very classical notion of like all guys studying right. Torah. And then, right. and that's like your, your kickoff portrait in the sense of a literal like painting. And then at the end, you have this painting that's actually not just a painting. It's a painting and also like a sculpture because there's a person sort of sitting on the edge of the frame and extending their way outward from the actual two dimensions of the painting and into the three dimensions of our space. And it's no accident that the artist for the later portrait or picture was is Banksy who's a British renegade, you know, who's outside every frame. And we don't even know who for sure they are. So, you know, this is a, a statement, a political statement on my part, that in this contemporary thinking, we have to think very differently about what fits in, inside the frame and what's outside the frame. Just to roll back, John asked if I knew anyone else who might want to do a portrait. And I said, I didn't know, but I'd put out a call for proposals. And I had 32 proposals in two weeks. In the Jewish education world, nobody gets 32 proposals about anything. And they were from all over the world. They were from all over the spectrum. What was interesting is that very few of them were about adult Jewish learning. I decided for the first book, which came out three and a half years ago, not to include portraits of adult Jewish learning. So when that book was done and well received, John said, so are you ready for a, another volume? And I said, I would love to do that. And I would love to focus on adults. And I wasn't really sure, would there be the equivalent 32 applications? And in fact, there weren't. So ultimately, I chose the handful of people whose portraits are in the current volume, having heard that a lot of organizations didn't have the capacity to do this kind of documentation. At the same time, I heard how hungry practitioners were for examples and language models. One of the things um, in, in this book, the fact that Sarah Alpert from um, Avodah let us print their learning objectives. Do you know how unique that is? We never see what the learning objectives of other organizations are. We have no basis for comparing. I said, Sarah, Sarah that alone, from an educator point of view, how does an organization decide what they want you to learn? And then what do they do to set it up to facilitate that? These portraits came from, I know, a fraction of what's out there. I believe there are many, many, many other portraits of adult Jewish learning that need to be written, that can, can speak to one another, that can be instructive. But that gets into the whole politics of research and politics of Jewish education where the commitment is at this point, and the funding has not been there for adult Jewish learning all along. And just to give a little clarity on what this really looks like, I mean, just to talk about the first portrait, you're literally like a fly on the wall at a museum, and you're listening to these people walking through the museum, going from exhibit to exhibit, and they're kind of talking to each other about what they're learning, what they're discovering. You know, and then the, the next one is is uh, a bunch of actors that are involved in a creating of a new play with Aaron Henney, one of our former guests. And, you know, they're sort of figuring out the source material for this story, right? And so you want to talk more about, like, what is really a portrait? And, and, and I guess, like, I'm also wondering, like, what is a portrait as compared to 
the more academic thing like how how are those in in dialogue with each other how and also what are their limitations like i i kind of was reading the book and kind of i i had the the funder voice over my shoulder saying yeah but how many people were doing that in the last three months you know so how does that work together so that i think that is one of the differences between research and evaluation i'm coming out of a research mode And this is qualitative research, not quantitative. So in qualitative research, we're observing a phenomenon, taking in all of the factors and the features, and we're reporting it. We may, as as the researcher, bring our own voice, particularly in portraiture. It's an expectation. This is a, a relatively new social science methodology to do something where the researcher's voice was in the in the article. That was not acceptable social science research. You were detached, you were trying to prove something, you were collecting quantifiable data. The world of qualitative research has given permission and encouraged these kinds of narratives that frankly have the reader do some of the work. I as a researcher don't have to do all of the interpretation. You as a reader are making meaning and analyzing and seeing whether you think things are having an impact. The funder issue, show me that it, you know, show me the outcomes, show me that something was learned. One of my experiences is that many adult Jewish learners don't know what they've learned. You ask, well, so what did you learn? And that's not how they organize it. They'll talk about the teacher. They'll talk about a key moment where they saw something that was exciting to them. But this language of learning isn't necessarily what the, how the learner describes what's going on. So this is an opportunity for the researcher to watch the learners, to talk to the learners, and to report out what's going on, what the process is, without the demand that there's something that can be shown that was learned. I do want to just insert here a a particular beef of mine, which is that funders who ask for all these evaluation studies those studies never get published. The organization holds the evaluation study and uses that to demonstrate, yes, I should get more funding for my project. But what was learned from those evaluation studies is not made public. So the learning that could go on cross organization is lost. And that to me is a great sadness because, you know, Avo does learn things that one table should know about. One tables learn things that people in the experiential M square should know about. We should have these cross dialogues. Unfortunately, at most of the adult Jewish learning gatherings, conventions, as it were, um, it's a lot of show and tell. Look what I did, look what I did, but not deep analysis. What can we learn from one another? What is the theory we're generating here? What's working, what's not? Why isn't it working? Those are all researcher questions. That has not been part of the practice so far. So three essays came at the beginning of your book after, after the intro. I'm, I, I, apparently, I'm in a chronological mindset today. I don't know. I'm not always. I usually am hopping all over. But um, we talked about your intro. There, there's a few essays that come next. And as the reader, I had this funny experience where I was waiting for something. And I'll explain what I mean. The first essay was an essay about the experience of four people, not more than four, just literally four guests at a museum. Two couples. And, you know, this fly on the wall situation where you're hearing their little commentary to each other, which pieces of the exhibit they're resonating with, etc. And I was kind of waiting for the big hot take about what this reflects about the universe, not the universe, I'm hyperbolizing, but like about other spaces. And there wasn't so much. And I was like, oh, that's okay. That's the, the first essay. But the second essay might have that. So the second essay was this one about Theater Dibbuk, wonderful organization that we collaborate with, stuff about them in the show notes. You should definitely go and look. I said it before, listeners, go to the show notes. But that was about the experience of these actors and how they were learning. And I was waiting in that. I was like, oh, so soon we're going to get to the experience of the audience when they see the show. And we're gonna learn what the audience thought about this production that we just heard about. But that doesn't come because the point of this essay is actually not to tell you what 
the production did to the, I don't know, I don't want to say like the students, they're not students, but like the recipients. It's actually right. about the educational experience of people who are acting and themselves going through months of preparation and conversation. And even for me, as somebody who spends a lot of time like thinking about we should conceptualize Jewish education, not just as what you do in the classroom, but what do you learn on the car ride home? What do you talk about at recess? What do you like? Still, I was in this mindset of, well, the moment of education is the performance. It's when Theodor Dybbuk does this beautiful production of Exegog and not the creation of Exegog. And I, but by the end of that second essay, I was like, click, I get it now. And then when the third piece came and it was about Avodah, um, Avodah being a social justice organization where people live in a house together and they're all doing social justice work. And I was no longer waiting for the part of the essay that would talk about how they then educate their different constituencies in the institutions they work for through Avodah. I was like, oh, no, the point of this is to talk about how people learn in places they don't realize necessarily they're learning. So that's three specific situations. This museum portrait, this theatrical portrait, and this, I don't know, justice house portrait. And if you asked people what those organizations were, so if you ask them what kind of organization that museum is, they say, oh, it's one, it's one of the Jewish museums. They wouldn't say it's a Jewish education project. Theater Dibbuk, I don't think people primarily think of them as education, although they do consciously blur art and education. People think of them as, you know, Jewish art, Jewish theater. And with Avodah, people think of them as, you know, Jewish justice more than education. But how might these portraits help us to rethink those lines we draw between, you know, art on the one hand, education on the other, museum on the one hand, education on the other? All right. So I'm going to start with the Jewish museum portrait, because I think one of the Lauriari's makes the case that these couples walking around the museum become Havruta to one another. They are study partners in this environment where they are encountering new information in the exhibits. And suddenly one partner, sometimes the Jew, and in, bo in both cases, these are uh, multi-faith couples. So sometimes the Jewish partner is the resource person framing what that exhibit was about. But sometimes the questions of the other person become the basis for the, the discussion. So one of the members of the couple was African American, and she got so excited to see the Alyssa Staunton exhibit of a uh, African first African American female rabbi, and she was quite uh, felt a sense of identification. So her their conversation about those things become the teaching moment, the learning moment. So it's not that it's this big splash. This is Jewish education. It's the process of learning. In that case, how the Hevruta, the learning partners, in an informal setting, help one another to deepen their understanding. In the Theodor Dybbuk example, there was never any question in Miriam Hellerstern and Tobin Belzer's mind that they were going to talk to the audience members. This was what goes on in the Theodor Dybbuk creative process. We all enter into new learning. We go on the internet. We're curious about something. And it takes us down the rabbit hole. We learn and we go from website to website. Suddenly we know a lot more about a topic than we ever thought. And we've done, that's all self-directed, individual, doesn't take a teacher. We become autodidacts. We learn from, from our own experience. But it, then they come back together, these creatives, and bring what they have learned about Jewish history or about the Moses character in the Exodus story. And they bring what they've learned and it begins to shape how they write this script. Well, we're all doing that every day in our lives. We're taking the information we get about something Jewish and suddenly we're trying it out. What's a Haggadah? What's the script for to read at the Passover Seder? And suddenly, oh, maybe I could bring in this reading or maybe I could write my own Haggadah. That's a, an adult Jewish learning experience in wonderful ways. And I think that's what the, the theater Dippic creative experience is, tapping in to the creativity of the, of the actors and the production staff, thinking, how can we tell this story, ancient story, and tell it in a way that has personal meaning in today and relevance? 
As far as Avodah is concerned, the contribution of that chapter from my point of view as an editor is about productive discomfort. We are not obligated to be altogether comfortable in our learning. Emerging adults, these young Avodonics, what, what they're doing as young adults, many of whom are, have been rather disaffected from Judaism, but they're in a, they've elected to be in a Jewish house, in a Jewish program, learning some basic Jewish things. And then they go into their, the community for service, and it's not so easy. And they have to come to terms with, who am I? What do I stand for? How do I want, want to represent certain values? And are they Jewish values? That productive discomfort leads to a lot of growth. That chapter is all about how these three young adults grow and claim their Jewish identities in very different ways, but it's not for having been coddled or spoon fed. They have to discover it themselves. Another essay, I, I'm just sort of hopping essays because I, sure. I felt like I was at a buffet and I, I got a nice little taste Good. of everything, but I'm going up for seconds because you know I'm talking to the chef. But <laughs> an essay that I found really fascinating was this essay about converts in a particular congregation in Southern California. And really, uh, it did what I think a good portrait does, which is it made me think of, huh, what if there's a lot of other communities that are maybe not identical to this, but similar to this? To say what I mean, this was a community where the, the authors themselves were Latinx Jews having a moment where they decided they want to go to the synagogue and like learn some Jewish Hebrew. stuff, uh, uh, learn Hebrew. Thank you. And they go and they walk in the room and they're like, everybody's speaking Spanish. They are placed in the situation where they realize, wow, I'm surrounded by other people who are looking to convert to Judaism or already have converted to Judaism, whatever it might be. And that's not what I expected. And it pushes us to think about, you know, what do we think Judaism looks like? What does Judaism actually look like today? What could it look like in the future? And I mean, there was a moment with the rabbi of this synagogue where he said pretty bluntly, I, I, I don't know this rabbi, but I, I found it very refreshing. He was just like, our synagogue's not going to have many non-Hispanic members. Very, it's just not like they're not going to be around the people who come and are engaged and are members. They're folks who are Latinx. That's that's who's here. And so we could like be grouchy about that, which would be pretty messed up. Or we could say, wow, OK, this is changing. If our synagogue is going to exist, this is what it's going to look like. And this essay then sort of dove into what it does look like. And I'd love to hear from you about what it was like to for you to read that, because that was my experience reading it, and a little bit about what that essay helps us to learn. We just come up against our assumptions and have to face how irrelevant those assumptions are when we read this chapter by Lourdes Seguias and Anne Rivero. They are challenging us to put on a totally different lens, a set of glasses, to look at what is it to be Jewish, what is it, what is meaningful, to these converts, the people they were interviewing mostly were undocumented, low socioeconomic status, people who had found in Judaism were tremendously excited in many cases to have found through DNA testing that they had Jewish forebears wanting to be buried in Israel. Um, so different from what we in the convention, the traditional Jewish organization, the Federation world, knows how, or the synagogue world, knows how to serve this population. I think one of Lourdes and Anne's biggest messages in this chapter for me was, what are we doing as a community to meet these learners where they're at? We don't have materials for them written in Spanish. What are we doing to help them? Or are we, do we have our own prejudices and our own biases that isn't as welcoming as we would like to think. And this is actually very much related to the later portrait by Yaf Epstein and, and Tali Zelkowitz about Wexner heritage leaders who have to come to terms with their own internalized biases about pluralism within the Jewish community. Oh, well, I'll be inclusive so long as they're Jews like me. How we're going to push people to broaden their thinking because it is a changing world and the Jewish community isn't going to look the same. If anything, this book, one of the themes is there are Jews out there that we haven't been counting 
And how are we going to identify them, count them, and meet them from an educational point of view? What you're saying in this conversation is making me think a lot about our conversation just a couple of weeks ago with Janet krasner Aronson, and also of Brandeis, because... We were talking about this recent study of L.A. that was done, Mm -hmm. but also other studies in other cities that have asked different kinds of questions and are getting new data. And one of the things that that Janet raised was just that each of these studies is kind of its own thing. It's commissioned by its own city, and it may not be comparable to, you know, you may not necessarily be able to compare what you learn in L.A. to what you learn in Houston or Boston or whatever. And yet, of course, there are a lot of things that probably do speak to one another. And there's also this question about, well, who's doing that bridging work? You know, who whose job is it to take all of these studies in all these different cities, which are a little different, and kind of try to try to tell us what we're seeing in common here. And, you know, I I submitted that I thought it was an academics job. And Janet said, yeah, show me the money. You know, somebody needs to fund that research. I'm wondering whether it's the same here as you're describing these different portraits. And then, you know, you talked about how there could be so many other portraits that are out there that just, you know, haven't surfaced yet. How do we move it from the realm of a scattershot sense that, oh, yeah, we're definitely not doing things right. There's definitely a lot of things that we're not realizing to some kind of policy making or, you know, and, and by that, I don't mean that some somebody's going to come down and make policy. But I mean, like that the people that are going to have an impact on this, whether that means schools of education or rabbinical schools or funders or podcasts or whoever is going to try to change the world in light of a book like this. What are the next steps as you see them? So I'd like to hope that that the sociologists will continue to give some some ways to look across studies and look look across patterns. But I think the the thought leaders need to be required... (laughs) to sit and discuss these things with each other. A line that I am teased about sometimes, but being my favorite line about, look for the people who live inside the same questions that you do. Some of us are living inside these questions, and yet where are our conversations? And that's really my message at the end of the book. Doesn't have to be with a lot of money, but there has to be a commitment to how seriously can we talk about all these studies learning from the young people who are creating new new models you're creating these conversations too how do we keep that's what keeps us going and alive is part that's one of the takeaways that community matters context matters um a young adult jew in brooklyn is having a different contextual experience community experience than a jew at the university of wisconsin or the jew in miami Context really does make a difference, but learn from the experience of a certain context. Um, The other thing is there's a lot of vulnerability among adult Jewish learners. So many people don't feel they have enough to go on. Across the board, as a community leader, you don't necessarily feel that you're well enough educated. You don't have the right kind of literacy. I think this vulnerability Will we be able to take the onslaught of anti-Semitism? Will we be able to to meet the needs of the underserved populations? There are all kinds of ways that our own vulnerability shapes the need for more education. That's a good motivator. You don't know enough, you want to go learn more. But the vulnerability is there, and we have to, to honor it. Well, on the subject of vulnerability, I, I was thinking as you were talking about finishing the book during this period, what are your thoughts about digital Jewish learning and, and where, you know, is that, does she, I, I, I jokingly said to you, that should be your next book. And you said, thanks a lot, you know, but I am <laughs> curious whether there should be uh, some, some new kind of thinking there and what that would be. And, and when you were talking about the Latinx converts, for example, you know, that got me thinking about our early conversation with Juan Mejia, who's a rabbi who's been doing Spanish language YouTube videos for exactly, not exactly this population, but people in Central America who also believe that, you know, they have or find that they have Jewish ancestry and and this whole thing. And and I was just blown away by the idea that, wow, what if the future of Judaism, you know, what if the, the vast majority of the growth of Judaism would actually come from populations that are not 
currently Jewish. And that would be just a complete paradigm shift on, on all of this. And nobody is talking about it. Nobody has that on the table as a serious possibility that Jewish policymakers should be thinking about. So I, I wonder how we can take some of the portraits in your book and that maybe we're not thinking daringly enough about them. The possibilities for learning because of the digital age are just daunting and exciting and overwhelming. And learning is very much linked to, I want something different from what I know now. It may be that I want to become better at my work, or it may be that I want to see other people, or maybe I just love learning, the lishma, or it may be that I have a spiritual need and through learning, I get that fed. But those motivations tap into the, or link in to me that this question that you're asking, Dan, to, I believe there is a motivation to learn. I think Jewish adults around the world, around the globe, are hungry for more, a better, more informed, more challenging, more dynamic Judaism. And what we've seen during COVID is People are, are showing up online. They're showing up for these learning experiences and they're sticking with it and they're moving on to other things. And one could say, well, after COVID, people won't keep coming. I don't think that's the case. I think we've tapped into a way of interacting with information. I really appreciated before when Lex said, you know, uh, listeners, tell us how you would label that. That's an invitation for the conversation. It isn't us labeling it. You know, the reader, the, the, the listener in this case, is also it's making both. meaning. They're, hopefully the listeners will be your readers and the readers will be Read, Well, yeah, my readers, but also Judaism Unbound's podcast listeners are also creating the future here and determining what learning should look like and whether people need a retreat, whether people need a travel program, whether people need a reading list, whether people need a study partner. I mean, all of these things are happening and are happening because of the digital possibilities. It's a both and. I think we can benefit tremendously from the technology and from the, the resources of a, of a digital world. We've got to have relationships that can help one another to celebrate, mourn, spaces that also mark time together. So a short and sweet question that I'm really excited about. Your book is Portraits of Adult Jewish Learning, and it profiles a wide variety of really cool projects. If our listeners of Judaism Unbound were to take on the effort of crafting their own portrait of Jewish learning, about their experience over the years or over the weeks, however long it's been, of listening to Judaism Unbound, what kinds of questions might they ask themselves? What might they reflect on? So just that as a closing note, and uh, that's not hypothetical, listeners. We would love to hear those from you. As a researcher, you're asking people to document their own experience, jot down notes about those episodes, either that they recall or starting now. What are the moments listening to these podcasts that just zing for you? So I think that we all become documenters of our own key moments. For some people, it's a, a visual. For some people, it's a parable or a story. Um, for some people, it's a list. What did someone on the podcast say as your teacher? And then I would also document how your learning from Judaism Unbound led you to other inquiry. You either signed on for the Yeshiva class or a course, or you, you went to a meditation retreat or you went to a Jewish museum or whatever it was that you heard about that sparked you to do something else along your Jewish learning journey. For the listener, being mindful of what did the learning look like and what made a difference. Thank you so much, Diane Tickton schuster for joining us. This has been a fantastic conversation. I loved it. Thank you so much as well. And thanks so much to all of you out there for listening. Before we close things out fully, we're really, really interested in portraits of Judaism Unbound's adult Jewish learning from all of you out there that are saying, in a similar way to what these portraits in Diane Ticton Schuster's book do, what happens to you when you are listening to this podcast and afterwards? 
So if you're down to take a few minutes now to just pause this podcast, open up an email that you address to dan at judaismunbound.com and lex at judaismunbound.com and reflect on what are some of those key moments in the podcast's history or recent past for you? Are there particular pivot points where some guest of ours has said something that's had an impact on you, where you have felt called to go to some Jewish experience that you might not have otherwise. All of those things are really important to us, and they help us understand what we actually do. I mean, we are only one side of the story. You're just as important on the other side. So send your portrait of Judaism Unbound learning to us via email. And just like with this exercise, we also appreciate hearing from you generally, whether that's a portrait of learning or just saying, hi, how's it going? Um, you can do that by going to Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Our handles are at Judaism Unbound. You can head to our website, JudaismUnbound.com. And once again, you can email us at Dan at JudaismUnbound.com or Lex at JudaismUnbound.com. One important note right now that Dan mentioned at the top is that we've got our On Yeshiva courses for the fall, our mini courses that are launching. We've got more courses coming up, but the mini courses are already available to sign up. You can do so at judaismunbound.com slash classes. Check out our amazing mini courses. We're going to be featuring some of the folks that are teaching them in the coming weeks. We really, really are excited about these. Sign up, head to our website to do so. So thank you so much for listening. And with that, this has been... Judaism Unbound.